Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Richie May CFO Controller webinar series. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me okay. If not, I believe there is a question, uh, a section for you to, to ask questions. So I encourage you to do uh, go ahead and do so. We've we've hosted them, hosted webinars in the past, but this is our first one actually conducting on our own. So uh, hopefully we get it up all right to begin with, and if not, please let us know. Um, so basically, uh, we at Richie May are working on a series of uh, webinars to to highlight current and emerging in emerging topics that will have a direct effect on your operation and decisions. We plan on covering a large range of topics, you know, general audit and accounting, tax compliance, tax planning, and also uh, mortgage banking specific topics. And that could both be, uh, could be accounting, tax, and it might even be operational. Uh, you know, best of all, these webinars are, are basically free to all the participants and they're designed for the specific benefit of our clients. As you saw in, in the invitations today, we're going to do a, a mortgage banking study basically for the year ended uh, December 31st, 2010, and we're going to go over some uh, proposed lease accounting standards. Presenters today are, are myself, I'm Trevor Reinhart, and, and John Gregg, we're both audit managers with, with Richie May. Uh, I'll be going over the mortgage banking study, and John will be going over the lease accounting section. Um, you know, we're planning on doing these quarterly, so we're, we don't have the exact date yet, but please be uh, prepared for the next one coming in mid-October. We're still going through topics, so if there's anything that you would like to like to hear us present on, you know, please feel free to let us know. Otherwise, we'll, we'll do our best to bring relevant topics. So to get started, uh, the, the first one is going to, we're going to be going over is the mortgage banking benchmark. So this first section we're showing kind of a, basically we took an average, a blended average of, of uh, all of our clients in the mortgage banking industry as of December 31st. And this is where most of the information is coming from. This first section is, is hitting a lot of the key ratios. You know, basically, across the board, the ratios have, have increased as warehouse lenders have begun uh, requiring greater liquidity. As you can see, the leverage ratio, um, you know, historical warehouse covenants have required ratios anywhere between 12 to 18 to 1. Uh, and of those enti entities in the survey, most had a, a leverage ratio, uh, or 67 percent of them, excuse me, had a leverage ratio of anywhere from three to ten to one, so a little bit below what what his, what, what warehouses are typically requiring. Um, equity ratios have increased as lenders, investors, and regulators uh, have begun to require a stronger capital base and return on capital. Um, Higher returns on capital have allowed companies to boost their, their ratios without having to raise additional capital. Uh, here we're seeing the average loan production. Uh, you know, 2010 was was just over a billion, whereas in uh, 2009 it was close to 1.5 billion. So that is a 30 per, 30 percent decline from the prior year. We saw a uh, uh, a 32 percent decline in, in retail production, a 48 percent decline in wholesale production, and direct consumer increased about 38 percent. Average net income um, in total dollars declined 13 percent from prior year. So you can see it was 4.6 million in 2010 versus uh, 4.365 million in 2009. And you can see that it was uh, However, the good news is it went from 36 basis points of total production uh, up to 44%. Uh, gross loan revenue 
Uh, again, we, we're seeing an increase there of, a four, of approximately 43% basis points. And, and a lot of what we're, we're seeing that's due to higher secondary marketing revenue. And basically interest margins, uh, you know, in 2010 there were none, whereas in, in 2009, um, you know, there was a slight positive uh, spread. And that's due to, you know, warehouse, warehouse lenders typically setting up floor for, the, for their margins. So the first thing we'll look at was we'll look at the statement of operations. Um, so here's a quick look at, at 2010, and this is a blended average of all of our of all of our clients. Um, so I, I believe it's approximately 50, and that includes retail, wholesale, uh, direct to consumer, and every everything in between. And there's kind of a snapshot versus uh, 2009. Uh, for any of you that may have seen uh, this presentation that Keith May presented, it's a lot, of, a lot of similar information, but I've also kind of sliced it and diced it a little bit different to give, you know, to, to uh, concentrate on some more of the financial stuff versus maybe some more of the operational stuff. So, you know, average loan margins increased in 2010 by uh, uh, approximately 37 basis points. And again, as I mentioned, that that's due in large part to the higher secondary marketing revenue. Um, as indicated in the snapshot report, you know the uh, interest margins here for 2010 are basically zero, whereas there was a, po a slight positive in 2010. Um, some of the interesting items to take a look at, you know, commissions as a percentage of production increased only about two basis points from the prior year. Uh, which indicates a disconnect from the increased loan margins, but plays a large part in the overall increased profitability of our clients. Um, overall, salaries, commissions, and benefits increased a total of you know 17.6 basis points for the prior year. So that's a that's a sum total of the first three expenses in each year. Um, you know, one of the questions we typically get is when you see this tax number, it's it's obviously pretty low. Um, that's kind of artificial in that only 11 of the entity surveys were, were actually taxed as a C-Corp. So gain on sale of, of mortgage loans and other fees, net of direct costs, represent 96% of total revenue. No shock there. And we're typically seeing direct expenses, uh, so this is direct loan expenses, run between 10 to 15 percent of total loan revenues. Again, net interest margins were zero. Servicing and kind of all the other stuff that don't fit into one of the top buckets, total 4 percent of total revenues. Uh, as expected, the single biggest line item on mortgage company income statement is salaries, commissions, and related tax and benefits. And that accounts for approximately 70% of the total expenses. Uh, G&A ex expenses were 9%, marketing costs 5%. Um, so that those two together account for 14%. Occupancy and provision for loan losses account for 11%. And everything else is, is basically less than 2% individually and 5% in aggregate. Now we're going to take a look. We're going to break up the 2010 income statement um, by production model. Um, you know, we, we kind of, we're going to cover retail, wholesale, and direct-to-consumer. Most companies have some sort of blend therein. Uh, we try to fit them in you know, to their primary business model, and, you know, so some of them um, are not 100% retail. Retail typically includes, you know, some of the net, net branch entities, that sort of thing. So, you know, the retail model's average net loan revenues for the year was 30, uh, 306 basis points, 
which was approximately 17 percent the, sorry, 17 basis points higher than the blended average. The retail model, they had the highest uh, loan margins and gross gross loan revenue, uh, and that was on the second highest loan production. You know, as is typical, the retail model paid out the highest uh, commission percentage, which amounted to 0.95 percent of total production. And this is basically 15 basis points higher than the overall average. Next, we'll take a look at some the wholesale. You know, the wholesale had the thinnest loan margins of all three uh, operating models. It is approximately 100 basis points lower than the blended average. But the interesting thing here is, is the wholesale, they had the... Uh, They had the strongest um, net income margins of the entire group. Uh, the wholesale model you'll see here at 655 million was the lowest of all three models. Uh, direct to consumer recognized pretty solid loan margins at 253 basis points, which is only 30, 36 basis points off of off of the average. The direct-to-consumer model is, is showing a fairly even split between commissions and salaries. Um, and that commissions is coming in at 46 basis points, where salary and wages is, is about, about 57 basis points. As expected, they have the highest uh, loan production volume at $1.57 billion for the year. And... This is a weighted average. It's not a true average. So, um, you know, obviously retail has the highest volume, so that's weighted a little bit more. You know, overall, there's no discernible difference um, in the interest margins between the three models, although the, uh, the wholesale model did have the lowest interest spread. Uh, here's kind of a, a quick snapshot of uh, loan margins by um, by operating model and by year. So the first one we're taking a look at is retail, 3.064 percent production in the current year versus uh, 2.609 percent the prior year. Wholesale uh, increased from to 1.89 from 1.283 percent. And there's direct to consumer and um, the blended average. You know, all models recognize the increased loan margins from the prior year, as we discussed. And although wholesale had the thinnest loan margins of the group, they realized the biggest jump in loan margins of approximately 62 basis points. So that's these, uh, the red bar here. And next, we'll take a look, uh, look at production volume by year and operating model. And retail, the red is wholesale. Next, we'll see direct to consumer. Um, you know, you can see, although overall there was a, a significant decline, 32% in production from the prior year, direct to consumer uh, actually increased 38%. And there we take a look at the blended average. Again, down 32 percent. All right. Next, we'll take a look at the balance sheet, and again, we'll present it in aggregate, and then we'll we'll break it out a little bit by operating model. Um, you know, as we discussed earlier, company companies are having higher liquid assets than the prior year. So this year, cash and interest-bearing accounts came in 7.86 percent versus 7.5. Um, the one thing to take a look at is in our presentation here, the restricted cash was grouped up with cash and interest-bearing last year. So on top of that 7.86 percent, there's an additional 1.31 percent 
held in restricted cash. So you can really see the amount. Although that's restricted, you can really see the, the jump in li liquid assets from the prior year. A couple of other interesting topics. Um, you know, it, it doesn't show it on the face of the balance sheet here, uh, but we did note a significant increase in, in mortgage servicing rights from the prior year. Um, so 11 of, of the 49 entities that were included here retain some level of servicing rights. The other thing to take a look at is um, in derivatives. So in hedging, basically 37 of the 49 entities um, were doing some level of hedging in the current year. And of those, 32 had the, had the net derivative asset. So a portion of it is up in the asset column. Some other ones were upside down and were down in, is shown down in the liability column. So as is typical, loans held for sale account of 81% uh, of, of total assets. Um, you know, this obviously doesn't include any off-balance sheet loans, so your early purchase or accelerated purchase facilities, that obviously would increase this ratio. On average, companies are maintaining 9% of the balance sheet in liquid cash marketable securities with an additional 1% held in restricted cash. And basically everything else, your derivatives, your net fixed assets, and your mortgage servicing rights average between 1%, 1 to 2% of total assets. So on your liabilities and equity, um, you know, we're seeing warehouse line, line of credit typically average 93% of the loan sell for sale. I think that bears out looking at the pie chart. You know, companies typically have minimum other short-term debt and long-term liabilities. Uh, you know, those represented 3% uh, of the total liabilities. And that's mainly, you know, subordinate debt and equipment financing of some sort. Uh, AP and other accrued expenses represent approximately 6% of total expenses, of total liabilities. And on average, companies maintain $10 million of equity capital with an average ratio of 5%. So now we'll break it out again by retail, wholesale, and direct-to-consumer. Uh, the first one we're taking a look at today is the, the retail. Basically, the, the retail model mirrors the blended average pretty closely. Um, you know, the retail had the highest percent of mortgage servicing rights to total assets of all three models at 3.43 percent. Um, wholesale had the highest level of cash and cash equivalents of the entire group at 26.6 percent total assets and the lowest loan sell for sale average at 63.23 percent. Additionally, they had the, the lowest uh, percentage of mortgage servicing rights of the entire group. Uh, the direct -to consumer model, it, it tracked with, re with the retail model pretty closely if you look down the percentages of each and the the weighted average, and again, this is weighted. Um, it's not a it's not a true average of the three columns here. Um, uh, of the three the three models presented here, the wholesale had the highest equity percentage at thirty eight point two point uh, one two percent. Other than that, you know, aside from the uh, the levels of cash and, and loan sell for sale, um, I think the assets are, are more or less the same across the board. And again, we're seeing 
a correlation here between the, the different levels of loan sell for sale, the warehouse, um, equity for retails, about 13% 13, uh, 13 of total liabilities in equity for retail, for wholesale, it's coming in at 38%. Uh, direct to consumer at 17 percent. So this is kind of the sales pitchy side. Um, you know, we we can create a customized study for you. Kind of the benefits of our customized benchmark study are, uh, you know, we customize based on your operating model, um, so you're not kind of lumped in with the entire group we can take you know if you're direct to consumer we can take you and compare you to direct to consumer uh, so on and so forth we can also slice it by production volume so you know if you're in the 500 million dollar uh, production volume range you're not being compared to someone that's in a 10 10 billion dollar production range obviously those ratios are going to be skewed quite a bit uh, anything else that's kind of unique to your operation you know, for those of you that are, that are clients of ours, um, we have a pretty good handle on some of those things, and, and we can talk to you about what, what it is you're looking at, um, and we can help develop it based on those. Um, you know, we add analysis to highlight areas of strengths and weaknesses. You know, obviously both are good to know, and perhaps we'll help you um, either continue on in an area or revisit an area to, to make operational changes. And basically, it's a, it's a comparison to your direct peers rather than a large pool of companies that have little in common with you. So there, there's some other ones out there, but you're kind of grouped in with a, a big group of people. Um, these we're able to slice and dice it based on, again, your operating model, your production volume, so that it really is an apples-to-apples -apples comparison as best as we can get. Everyone has a, l a little bit different operations, but... Uh, we think it's it's kind of the best best out there. So basically, if you have any questions uh, on this section, um, or would like to discuss receiving, you know, doing a custom benchmark study uh, for your company, please contact me. Um, here's my information here. Uh, if any of you, you can just call a direct line. They'll patch you through to me. Um, there's my email address. Please feel free to to give me a call. Uh, I will make copies of of uh, the slides here and and a PDF report um, of the benchmark. We'll, we'll email all, all information in this webinar to to all the participants that have signed up. So with that, uh, my section is done. I'm going to hand you off to uh, to John Gregg, and he's going to go over the proposed lease accounting standards with you. Thanks, Trevor. Hello, hello, everyone. Hope you guys are having a good day. I'm going to talk to you guys about the proposed changes to lease accounting. The FASB and the IASB issued a joint exposure draft for leases that, if finalized as proposed, would significantly change how lessees and lessors account for and report leasing arrangements in their financial statements. The proposed guidance would impact almost every organization, lessees would account for all leases using a single right of use model that abandons the idea that the only asset to be accounted for in a lease is the underlying property. The model would require lessees to recognize an asset representing the right to use the underlying property over the estimated lease term, which is the right of use asset, and the liability to make estimated future lease payments in their statements of financial position for each lease. Lessees would no longer classify each lease as either operating or capital, and the model would fundamentally change the accounting and reporting of leases currently classified as operating leases and substantially increase both assets and liabilities of lessees. Essentially what you're doing is you're going to end up being grossing up your uh, balance sheet for operating leases. This was a joint project with the IASB, and it's... The fundamental idea is to, is to develop an improved standard on lease accounting that is consistent between U.S. GAAP and international standards. Unfortunately, we're heading to, uh, you know, uh, 
international financial reporting, you know, one of these days. They keep saying it's going to happen sooner rather than later, but it keeps getting pushed back. The, the exposure draft was issued in August of 2010 with comments due back in December of 2010. Uh, the comments came back, and the good news is, is they decided this last Monday that they weren't going to implement the final standard during 2011, so we're not going to have to deal with it for this year end. They've decided to delay their final decision on uh, the proposed changes to Lisa County until 2012, so at least we bought some more time. So with the proposed accounting models, there's going to be new models for both lessors and lessees. There are two models for lessors, which is the performance obligation model and the derecognition model, which I'll go into further detail later. The lessee model, which is a little more straightforward, and the one that's really going to impact most of you guys, because you know, almost everyone's leasing office space, uh, equipment, something like that. So that's that's where it's going to impact you guys. And I think I suspect fewer fewer of you are lessors. But the lessee model is the right of use model. The lessee recognizes a right of use asset and a liability for their estimated future lease payment obligations. So with the proposed guidance, uh, it applies to all leases, including subleases, except for leases of intangibles or natural resources, such as oil and minerals, and leases of biological assets, such as crops uh, or timber. And it also doesn't apply to contracts that represent a purchase or sale of leased property. At lease inception, a lessee would measure the liability at the present value of the estimated future lease payments. The future lease payments are estimated taking into consideration the lease term, contingent rentals, RV guarantees, and any term option penalties. The discount rate used is the lessee's incremental borrowing rate, or if more readily determinable, it would be the rate that the lessor charges the lessee. It, and the only way you'd know that is if the uh, lessor uh, stated that in the uh, lease agreement. The lease term used is the longest possible term that is more likely than not to occur. And listed here are some factors to consider when determining the appropriate lease term. There's contractual factors, non-contractual factors, business factors, and factors specific to the individual lease. The initial measurement of the right to use asset is the initial lease liability plus initial direct cost and prepaid rentals. And below are some uh, examples of some initial direct costs. There's commissions, legal fees, costs associated with negotiating lease terms, and costs of closing the transaction. They're probably the most common ones you're going to see. Listed on the right are some uh, items that aren't considered in a, initial indirect, or excuse me, initial direct costs such as overhead, advertising, etc. The lease liability to make estimated future lease payments is measured at amortized costs using the interest method. Lessees are required to remeasure the liability each reporting period only if facts and circumstances indicate there is a significant change. There can be changes in the carrying amount of the lease liability due to the reassessment of the lease term or reassessment of contingent rentals, residual values, uh, guarantees, and term option penalties. The, the, the key here is if you have to reassess any of these and it's related to future periods, you adjust the carrying value of the right of use asset. If it's in the current period or prior periods, you recognize it in the P&L. 
The right of use asset is measured in amortized cost. You amortize over the shorter of the lease term or economic or excuse me economic life of the lease property, which is typically a straight line, and, you, and the cost uh, is described as amortization in your financial statements, not rental expense, and it's subject to existing impairment testing uh, requirements for non-financial assets. This slide represents a summary impact to the financial statements of a lessee. The statement of financial position or the balance sheet presents the liability to make the estimated future lease payments separately from other financial liabilities. You present the right of use asset within PP&E separately from other assets that the lessee owns. In the statement of income or the P&L, you present amortization and interest expense separately from amortization and interest expense. In the statement of cash flows, you classify the cash repayments of principal and interest as financing activities separately from other financing cash flows. Now what's probably of lesser interest to you but I'll discuss is the lessor accounting models. Again, as I discussed before, there's two accounting models. There's the performance obligation approach in which the lease contract creates a new right and obligation. And there's the derecognition approach in which the lease contract results in the surrender of a portion of the economic benefits of the lease property in exchange for a new right. If a lessor retains exposure to significant risk or benefits associated with the lease property, then the performance obligation approach is used. If they do not, then their derecognition is the appropriate model. This slide summarizes which accounting model that should be used. If at the end of the contract, control of the lease property and all but a trivial amount of the risk and benefits associated with it are transferred, it's in substance a sale of the property, so it's not in scope. If a lessor does not retain exposure to significant risk or benefits associated with the lease property, then you use the derecognition approach. If the lessor retains ex exposure to significant risk or benefits associated with the lease property, then the performance obligation approach is used. Factors to consider when assessing risks and benefits retained include determining the expected term of the lease contract, such as significant contingent rentals or options to extend or terminate the lease. Other factors to consider subsequent to the term of the lease contract include whether the lease term is short in relation to the useful life of the lease property and whether a significant change in the value of the lease property at the end of the lease term is expected considering the present value of the lease property at the end of the lease term or any residual value guarantees. The lease receivable is the present value of the estimated future lease payments. Taking into account the lease term, contingent rentals, residual value guarantees, term and term option penalties. The discount rate is the rate the lessor charges the lessee. With the performance obligation approach, when, when you do your initial measurement of the lease property, the lease property is carried at the previous carrying amount. The lease receivable is the present value of the estimated future lease payments plus any initial direct costs. And the lease liability is the present value of the estimated future lease payments plus any prepaid rentals if there are any. And there's an example uh, entry that you would make on your initial recording of the lease. The day two accounting, which is essentially the subsequent measurement, the lease receivable is amortized cost using the effective interest method. You also have to evaluate for impairment according with the existing literature. 
and reassessment of the estimated future lease payments if facts and circumstances indicate a significant change in the lease receivable. The lease liability is amortized based upon the pattern of use by the lease property by the lessee. It's typically going to be straight line. And the P&L will include interest income related to the lease receivable, impairment if there is any, the effect of reassessment of the lease receivable that is recognized in the P&L if there is any, and income upon satisfaction of the lease liability. There can be changes in the carrying amount of the lease liability to due to reassessment of the lease term or reassessment of contingent rentals, the residual value guarantee, or uh, term option penalties. The key here is if it's related to future periods, you adjust the performance obligation unless the performance obligation is zero, in which case you recognize in the P&L. If it's related to current or prior periods, you recognize it in the P&L. And this slide just gives you an uh, example of what their financials, what accounts you're going to see on your financial statements. I'll just show them all here to you. On the balance sheet or statement of financial position, you're going to have leased property, a lease receivable, a lease liability, which is your performance obligation, and you present the items above separately, totaling to a net lease asset or liability. On your P&L, you're going to have interest income on your lease, re lease receivable. You're going to have income from satisfaction of the lease liability and depreciation expense of the uh, leased property. And you present the above items separately from interest income, inter uh, interest income, income, and depreciation expense. Uh, for statement of cash flows, most of you are going to use the indirect method, method, so you would present changes in lease receivable separately from changes in other operating receivables. I don't think any of our clients use the direct method. If using the derecognition approach, you will record a lease receivable, which is the present value of estimated future lease payments plus initial direct costs. And you'll also, you could record, most likely we'll record a residual asset, which is the allocation of the previous carrying amount of the lease property. And below here is an example of the entries that would be made uh, when you record it. The day two accounting under the derecognition approach, you'll have a lease receivable, which is amortized cost using the effective interest method. You'll evaluate for impairment in accordance with existing gap and reassess the estimated future lease payments if facts and circumstances indicate a significant change in the lease receivable. And then you also have your residual asset, which you'll evaluate for impairment in accordance with existing gap. The P&L will include interest income related to the lease receivable, impairment if any, and the effect of reassessment of the lease receivable that is recognized in the P&L if there is any. And this slide, this is our last slide, will show you, uh, again, a snapshot of the accounts that you will have uh, on your financial statements when you use the derecognition approach. On your statement of financial position or balance sheet, you'll have a lease receivable, which is your lease asset, it's a, which will be a separate line item from other receivables, and your residual asset, which is presented separately within uh, fixed assets or PP&E. On your P&L, you will have interest income on lease receivable presented separately from other interest income. If the lessor uses lease arrangements for the purpose of financing, then you present net lease income and expense in a single line item. If the lessor uses leases as an alternate alternative to selling, uh, then present lease income and expense as separate line items. And again, for statement of the cash flow purposes, if using the indirect method, you present changes in lease receivable separately from changes in other operating receivables. So that's a summary of the proposed changes to lease accounting. I know that's a lot of information, but the kind of the things to keep in mind, and, and most of us, again, will be dealing with this. Well, everyone's going to be dealing with it, but I think most of our clients will be dealing with it from the standpoint of a lessee. The accounting there is a little less complicated than if you are a lessor. Good news is, you know, it, we, uh, we're not going to have to deal with this in 2011 since the uh, 
the ISV in the FASB pushed back the, uh, the implementation of the uh, standard uh, uh, due to basically inconsistencies between the, uh, a lot of differences when they put out the exposure draft, they got all their comments back and there was just a big differences in what the FASB was hearing versus the IASB, so they got to come together on that. So uh, if you guys have any questions about this, this is my contact contact information, so feel free to, you know, give me a call or send me an email. And and these slides are pretty good to kind of cut through the uh, the uh, the accounting for this. So if you take it a piece at a time, I think we can all get there. So, But if you do have any questions specific to your own facts and circumstances, feel free to give me a call. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Like you said, this is this is our first uh, stab at it. So, if you have any feedback to for us to make it better, please feel free to, to share it with myself or John, or uh, that way we, we can improve it for you all going forward. Uh, again, we'll we'll get all this information emailed out to. <coughs> Pardon me, everyone on the attendee list. Um, we did record this. If, if uh, you would like a copy of it, we can make that available to you as well. So, uh, you know, if there aren't any other questions, I think that is uh, that's going to be it for us today. Uh, we appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you in October. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.